This episode brought to you by ExpressVPN, the best VPN there is. Take back your online privacy today. Also brought to you by Omen. Play together, watch together, chat together, all with Oasis by Omen. Ladies and gentlemen, behold the outcast, the creepy and depraved, the bizarre creations not meant for the normal world. Embrace the twisted weirdness of Freak Show Cinema! In 1968, Hanna-Barbera released their first live-action series, The Banana Splits. Even though it wasn't animated, you could still tell it was Hanna-Barbera. It had animals with silly voices using instruments to play songs of the era, and a supposed live studio audience that, well, seemed about as plausible as Scooby-Doo having a live studio audience. Someday I'm gonna roll these bananas into a basketball and bounce them the heck out of here! <laughs> yeah, that'd get me howling too. Though it only ran for 31 episodes, it lived on in syndication up until the early 80s. Since then, it's somewhat faded into obscurity. There are some people who remember it, usually those who say, pair it with Spongebob and H.R. Puff and stuff. Yo, son, you gotta roll some more of that shit up! <laughs> but didn't exactly get a whole lot of people talking anymore. Though wait, is it me or do they kinda look like the characters from the smash hit Five Nights at Freddy's movie? In 2019, a very different version of the Banana Splits was released. It was a self-aware horror film where the Splits were robots that get angry when they discover their kid show has been cancelled and take it out on an unsuspecting crowd. I'm just gonna say it, this idea's amazing! <laughs> it's a clever way to cash in on something that's already popular without necessarily ripping it off. The Banana Splits have been around since the 60s and there always has been something Kinda creepy about him. All the members of the Banana Splits who aren't here, do not raise your hands! <laughs> okay, a lot creepy about them. It's well known enough to still have a little bit of a fan base, but obscure enough to bring in a new crowd who'll probably laugh their asses off discovering this was an actual show. With everything pointing to this becoming a cult classic, the response was kinda mixed. The consensus seems to be the film is very standard, not many unique characters, surprises, or even laughs. But this does raise the question, is that intentional? Certain horror films can be like Christmas rom-coms. Hear me out. It's not that the target audience wants the exact same thing every time, but the expectancy for certain tropes can outweigh the absence of newer ideas. For example, when Halloween 2018 came out. It was built up as a brand new spin, the real sequel to the series, the one where anything can happen. And there was very little new to it. Jamie Lee was a little older, she kicked a little more ass, but everything else kinda just followed the traditional formula. And people loved it. They loved it because that's part of the charm of these movies, seeing people act like dumbasses, making the same mistakes, and getting obliterated by the slasher. But again, that's not saying everything stays the same. The ways the characters are dumb and obnoxious are altered, the creative ways they're killed are altered, and the mixture of modern updates and classic cliches are also altered. The same can be said for Christmas rom-coms. We know they're cheesy and repeat the same formula, but that's part of the fun. The various ways Christmas is shown, talked about, and ridiculously worked into these idiot stories is what makes us have a good time with it. So with that in mind, where does Banana Splits fall? Is the idea so clever and funny that it can overcome, even work well with its run-of-the-mill story and characters? Well, let's look at the setup. Pretty much from the beginning you can tell this is not going to be a faithful adaptation of the show. Even factoring in the genre change. Here's a clip from the original series. What is yellow? Wear the mask and yell, hi-ho, silver! The lone banana? <laughs> now here's one from the movie. We have to get Drooper out of Mr. Waldescheit's fence. Again. <laughs> There's not even an attempt to make these things feel like they're alive. And even the human characters in the show act like, yeah, I'm in on it. This is pretty lame, huh? Despite Hanna-Barbera being famously cheap, they did try to work in a lot of personality. This film from frame one wants you to look at them like dead-eye puppets. But as you'll later see, they're be a reason for that. We're introduced to Beth, played by Danny Kind, who has two boys named Harley and Austin. Harley is super excited to see the Banana Splits live in person for his birthday, while his stepdad and friend hostage Zoe, who is forced to go along, are less enthused. 
We're not even friends. Well, maybe he wants to be. Naturally at the show, which is filmed in front of an audience in this universe, that alone is pretty funny. They come across a slew of colorful characters. A desperate dad who wants his daughter to be discovered. You want to get discovered or not? Because if you're not committed to this, you tell me. Right now. A pair of tick... tubers. I'm not exactly sure what they are here. What's up, you guys? It's your boy Thad. Mr. Thadtastic to all my fans. And the unhappy people behind the scenes who find the only thing they hate more than working on the show is not working on it. As they discover when the new guy in charge, who does not look or act like a new guy in charge. The Banana Split show is done. It's my call. Live with it. <laughs> Dude, you just got done putting the cleaning supplies away. What are you doing smoking a cigar? Says the Banana Splits are going to be cancelled. Once the robotic stars catch wind of this, they slowly but surely start kidnapping people to keep the show going forever. The premise sounds promising enough, but believe me when I say these characters are boring as sin. They're all stock cutouts that go through the motions you would think they would go through. Sometimes off screen. The friend forced to go with at first has no interest in the show. Then completely out of nowhere, she's a fan. I don't want to see the banana splits. That shows for babies. I can't believe I'm actually here. I can't believe I'm actually enjoying it. There was no moment in between indicating she changed her mind. This couple trying to become web personalities is ripe for satire. But let me tell you, as someone who makes a living online obsessing over nostalgic properties, these two need to be a lot lamer. We're here at the TAF studio. And we're gonna be going live all day long, behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. Mistake one, it looks like you bathed. The only interesting characters are the ones who work because they, ironically, are good at playing non-interested people. The producers sometimes can get a laugh. Six years on a kid's show and I get fired. Time to fly! The brother sounds so unenthusiastic about literally everything, it's kind of hard not to love him. You're not supposed to be back here. That is true. Stage one is the oldest soundstage at Taft Studios. We're at a taping of the banana split. Maybe he's hiding somewhere. He probably doesn't want to leave. Mom, that was seriously badass. And the page, literally named Paige, goes back and forth between hating her job and pretending she doesn't hate her job so convincingly, it's hard not to have respect for her. Paige the page. Guess you could say I was born to do this job. God, I hope not. Everyone else ranges from kind of passable to forgettable, with a lot of their line reads not exactly being the most riveting. Are they doing the snarky shuffle? I tried to tell them that it's wrong, but they wouldn't listen. There's some messed up stuff right here. You love them, don't you? Yes. I love them too. They're my favorite. Ugh. But as you'll discover, that can lead to some pretty amusing punchlines. Take this pushy father trying to turn his daughter into a star. Stop chewing on your hair. I just paid $70 for that blowout and straighten up. This is such cookie cutter dialogue we've seen a million times with the girl never being allowed to say anything. She would realize that she had a star standing right in front of her. Probably even give you a promotion for making the introduction. But when he gets a chance to show her off to the producer and the girl finally talks, I could not predict this is what he was building up. What you gonna do with all that junk? All that junk inside your trunk? Stop! <laughs> that is disturbing. This is the only payoff we get with these two, and it's hilariously underwhelming. Yeah, he gets killed off, but that's to be expected. For all that buildup with this kid never talking, and that's what we get, it's brilliantly pathetic. Thank you for the opportunity. And if you stick with the movie, you find that's kind of what works about it. Whether it's aware of it or not, the first half lures you into a bland, unassuming state. So that its hilariously extreme second half catches you by surprise in what it does and doesn't come through with. How extreme is that second half? Well... I think we need a 90s commercial in order to prepare you for it. Hey, Mom and Dad! You don't get it! it. ExpressVPN has the taste kids love! Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like riding your skateboard without a helmet or knee pads, while also allowing your online information to be seen by anybody. That's why you need sugar-coated ExpressVPN! Internet service providers like Comcast or Verizon know every single website you visit. ISPs can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants, who then use your data to target you. Not today, tech giants. Because ExpressVPN is there to help. To the extreme! ExpressVPN creates a secure, encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet, so people can't peep on your online activity. With cinnamon and sugar in every bite. Just fire up the app and click one button. It's rated number one by CNET, Wired, and The Verge. It works on phones, laptops, even routers, so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected. And is part of a complete breakfast. 
I use it because my information is important to me. Can you imagine a grown-up seeing what pizza toppings you like? That's why you need ExpressVPN. Secure your online activity by visiting expressvpn.com slash nostalgiacritic today. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash NostalgiaCritic. And you can get an extra three months free. That's ExpressVPN.com slash NostalgiaCritic. And now with two proof of purchase, you can also get Omen. Omen officially has nothing to do with ExpressVPN. This is just a funny segue. Sick of all those randos sliding into your team chat whenever you and your friends are grouped up in your favorite games? Then you need your own private oasis, your own paradise in the, let's face it, what can't be a wasteland of online gaming. What's online? Oasis is a free and easy to use add-on for Omen Gaming Hub that creates a virtual room for you and up to 15 of your friends for private gaming and watch parties. But Oasis isn't just any virtual room. How come I'm a kid but I look almost 40? With low latency, 720p, 30 FPS screen sharing, and seamless audio quality, you can quit worrying about technical difficulties, stop arguing over who has the worst internet connection, and get to playing. And because you can use voice or text chat while you share your screen or play along with someone else's, Oasis is the best way to hang out when we can't, you know, hang out. What is this place? Make sure you have Omen Gaming Hub installed, then get the Oasis add-on to build your own gaming paradise. Play together, watch together, chat together, share together. All with Oasis by Omen. Go to bit.ly slash nostalgia oasis to download Oasis on the Omen Gaming Hub and try out the beta now. To the extreme! No, really, how do I get out of here? Head to this link today. I think that's a fitting amount of extreme. Let's continue. First off, the show now has an obstacle course for kids. As far as I can tell, there's never been anything like this for that totally real studio audience that was there, but you could always say this was just an add-on in this universe. Like, if the show kept going, it would evolve into this. When the pots take over, they force the producer of the show and the abusive father to run through it. <laughs> This is one of those moments where the more seriously it's taken, the funnier it is. If the music was big and the lighting bright and colorful, this would not be as amusing. But keeping it standard dark and gritty makes the surreality of it all the more hilarious. I did it! She did it! He took it down to Hammertown! <laughs> they also talk more as the film goes on too. At first, I was really turned off by the fact they barely said a word and had no personalities, unlike the show. But again, it makes you think they're not going to talk much in the second half. So when they do, it's surprisingly really, really funny. Especially when they start killing people off. All of our friends are here. Now the show can go on forever and ever. Smoking bad for your health. One of my favorite moments is this completely out-of-nowhere bond the youngest boy has with Snorky the Elephant. Like the others, he practically says nothing, but the boy randomly declares he's different. I can't trust him. It's Snorky. He's different. Again, he didn't do a damn thing to separate himself from the others, but that doesn't stop him from out-of-nowhere saving the day. Snorky, you'll always be my favorite. <laughs> It's so pointlessly spontaneous, it cracks me up. This all builds up to the climax where the robots are putting on another version of the show with the parents all murdered, the kids chained up in the audience, and the folks that were gonna cancel the show being horribly mutilated in the wackiest of ways. Banana! Split! What's the banana split? Ah! This is the highlight of the movie, and a lot of it is, again, because they didn't talk before. It's almost as if the movie was keeping their personalities a secret at first, so when it does get to the more gruesome parts, it's all the funnier to hear them chuckle and cheer. But that's not even the funniest surprise. Remember those two web personalities that never got a laugh? Well, one of them gets sawed in half. It's kind of standard for a film like this, but again, on top of their funny commentary... Ta-da! they actually make the girlfriend watch. Like she tries to run away and they force her to witness it. In any other film, this would be incredibly disturbing, but because it is those big eyed, silly faced characters holding her, it's incredibly humorous. But that's not even where the joke ends. The girlfriend goes totally insane and tries turning herself into the fifth banana split. Yeah. 
What do they end up doing with her? Pretty much nothing. She runs over the cheating stepdad and sequel baits the next one driving off with all the destroyed bots. <laughs> Yes, you could see this as a cheap letdown, but I don't know. I was not expecting this boring standard-ass character who started off like this to end like this. A part of me really laughs hard that they didn't utilize her in the story except as a throwaway joke at the end, similar to what they did with Steve Buscemi and Con Air. Add on top of that a slew of creative deaths I can't show because YouTube sucks, and I weirdly find myself having a pretty good time. For the second half. But part of why I enjoyed the second half is because the first half tricked me into thinking it was going to be boring and standard as hell. So how do you rate that? It's a fine line between self-awareness working for you and self-awareness working against you. To be effective in certain horror comedies, you have to treat silly material seriously. But how serious is too serious? And for that matter, how silly is too silly? Films like Dead Snow Scream and Sleepaway Camp work in their own way because it feels like the filmmakers are being genuine. But they also knew how to work in humor with their characters because, well, that's part of how you get audiences to like them. But some of their sequels, like Dead Snow 2, Scream 3, and Sleepaway Camp 4 fall short because they became too self-aware. This isn't like Zombieland or Tucker and Dale where it's a comedy first, then horror. These all started out with the charm of not knowing if they were meant to be taken seriously or not. But with the banana splits, the idea alone is clearly satirical. Everyone knows that going in. It is possible they decided to have little to no humor early on so they wouldn't fall into the same category as these sequels. But that leaves a pretty dull first half. That does follow the tropes a lot of horror fans like. But not in an interesting way. Which might be on purpose. See why this is hard to review? I give credit that a film like this knows it can be botched if it gets too jokey or winks at the camera too much. But how much less is more? For me, I think it works just enough. Do I wish the leads were more interesting and the killer bots had more personality? Yes, but I do think it's possible this was by choice and it does build up to some very entertaining moments because of that. It's similar to Krampus. The memory the film leaves may actually be better than the film itself, but I stand by that is technically achieving its goal. It doesn't make a great film you can watch over and over and over, but it can still remain with you for the intended reasons it's supposed to. The Banana Splits movie can be a success solely on the fact that it merely exists. A person could leave the film underwhelmed, but still look back laughing that they tried to do this with an obscure children's show and in such a serious manner. If you love the movie, I get it. If you hate the movie, I get that too. It's a film that's hard to universally agree on because it's in a genre that's both formulaic and experimental. Will it be remembered years from now? I don't know. I doubt the creators had anything like this planned for it decades earlier. Maybe we'll be too busy talking about the Saved by the Bell slasher film to remember this even existed. What I can say now about it, though, is it's a funny idea that knows it has to be serious to be funny. But that commitment will vary from person to person because comedy like horror is, and always will be, subjective. Tra la 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 la. I'm a nostalgia critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Are they doing the snorky shuffle? Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out, and uh, sadly these are released a week later, in which case I would have had this shout out done a little earlier, but uh, at the time I'm recording this, uh, a couple days ago, a uh, massive tornado uh, went through the Chicagoland area, and you know, we're fine, a lot of people are fine, but there's a lot of people that are not. They've lost their homes, uh, even chunks of their homes, many people were hurt, and uh, it's just really, really devastating. So the uh, charity we're going to do this week is the uh, Illinois Red Cross. Uh, we've been looking up to see which one seems to be the best that can help out with people who have lost their homes and lost so much and that seems to be the best one so uh we've done red cross before i mean everybody knows the red cross but uh, uh this one is specifically for illinois and uh you know helping those that uh have lost if not everything a great great deal so please check them out see if you can donate or spread the word and uh help these people out thank you so much